just looking at your book, you know, <laughs> I, I told you it's, it's over my uh, my bathtub, the flight of your life, man. So, I love it, man. Uh, that, that that title, man, is my journey, man. Wow, it's wow. It, it, it's almost as if God said, I'm getting ready to do this with you. And then I'm like, oh, okay, but here's what it's going to cost you. Here's what it's going to yeah, cost Yeah, a lot of people don't want to talk about that, That's man. Deep. There's a cost to success. There's a cost to progress. Yeah. And there's a process. And especially yeah. you talking about God, there's an initiation sometimes that happens when you're trying to walk into your destiny and your purpose. Yeah. And a lot of people don't fulfill it yeah. because they quit through yeah. the initiation process, yeah. man. Welcome back to Aspire Higher with Charles right. and Ivana Bailey. We're so excited to have you. Today's going to be a great day. We have such a special speaker in the house. I'm going to let Charles intro him, but if you have not, please go ahead and click the subscribe oh, yeah. button. Like, share, subscribe. That's all we ask. Like, <laughs> share, subscribe, okay? But Charles, go ahead and introduce us, man. Man, let me tell you now, you've always had in your mind Dr. Martin Luther King. Yeah. We got another king in the building. Uh oh. We got Dr. Okay. J. Okay. Barnett, mm -hmm. better known as King J. King J? So we got we got J the King. J. <laughs> you ain't never J. met no J the King. <laughs> well, I'm excited. What about J? Well, Tell J, me about man, Mr. King. former, former uh, football player, okay. has an incredible testimony and story, uh, went through some struggles, uh, suicide, and mm -hmm. some things that just... Transition his life. Yeah. He's an author. He's a yeah. keynoter. I already said he's a he's a doctor. Yeah. He specifically is an expert in mental health. Beautiful. He's mul yeah. he's written multiple books. Uh, he's got uh, Just Heal Bro Tour, which I know you may have heard yes. about. That is a Just big Heal. deal. He yes. is really changing and redefining mental health, yeah. not just yeah. for men, right. but women. Yeah. You know, he does culture. programs with kings and queens, as he calls them. Mm -hmm. Helps them to develop their their mental acuity so they can actually just grow. I'm telling you, this like guy it. is un real I and it. i am just honored to call him a friend and a brother <laughs> so hope i did justice by telling everybody who you are man because there's so much <laughs> about you bro so much about you man what's up welcome to the show man thank you for having me charles uh uh thank you for the introduction uh man and uh so humbling uh you know i it, it's, it's one of those things man i think uh as you continue to uh grow in life uh you begin to look at the ways in which you have had to develop mm -hmm. and the ways that you've had to grow in. And so when I'm hearing um, people say these things about me, I just start thinking about my process of growing mm -hmm. um, to become those things. And so for me, it's always humbling because my mind goes back to the moments, the moments where I had to say, wow, I got to make this decision. And uh, because I think you have to make a decision to grow and you have to make a decision to become. It's, it's not something that happens by happenstance. And so uh, I think about all of the intentionality that I've had to move with over the course of my life and, and, and particularly for the past 10 years in entering to this mental health space mm -hmm. um, after mm -hmm. leaving football and, and having my challenges in, in which we'll talk about. But yeah, man, it's, it's, it's an honor. I was just looking at your book. You know, <laughs> I, I told you it's, it's over my... Uh, my bathtub, the flight of your life, man. So, I love it, man. Uh, that, that that title, man, is my journey, man. Wow, it's wow. It, it, it's almost as if God said, I'm getting ready to do this with you. And then I'm like, oh, okay, but here's what it's going to cost you. <laughs> so yeah. and that's been the flight. Mm. Here's what it's going to yeah, cost you. Yeah, a lot of people want to talk about that, that's man. Deep. There's a cost to success. There's a cost to progress. Yeah. And there's a process, and especially yeah. you talking about God, there's an initiation sometimes that happens when you're trying to walk into your destiny and your purpose. Right. And a lot of people don't fulfill it yeah. because they quit through yeah. the initiation process, yeah. man. Talk a little bit about your journey, man. I, I kind of highlighted that at the beginning, but wherever you want to start, doctor, by all means, jump right in. But I think it'd be very, very engaging for people to know about that period of time that you went through that was mentally challenging enough for you to make you question living. Mm. You know, you know, for me, uh, I, I love to start uh, in the point of, of my childhood because I think for many of us, we don't really 
uh, relegate uh, who we are as adults to being a to, to being merely attached to our childhood. And I, I like to say this often with clients in therapy that grown adults are just you know small children. Right. And right. when I think about my journey and where most of my challenges and issues started from. It started from not being fathered well. You know, I was the only son and my uh, dad's a pastor. And so my parents were in, in, involved in ministry. And one of the things that really derailed me as a young man was the divorce, but also at that time, the character of my father, because who I saw in, on Sundays was not who we live with Monday through Saturday. Mm. So that was a bit boggling to a uh, nine to 10 year old mindset uh, because at this age, I had already accepted Christ. I, I, I had a walk with Christ and I also had uh, a clear distinction between uh, my father's um, work as a pastor, but also his work as a father. Mm. And mm -hmm. for me, the work as a father was where I saw him failing a lot. Mm -hmm. But at mm -hmm. nine, 10 years old, you don't really understand how to voice that and articulate that to your parents. And I was a very precocious kid. Um, I understood more than what my parents gave me credit for. And I never forget walking into the bedroom one night and my mother was crying. And I knew why she was crying. Uh, I don't know why I knew that. And I knew it was something that my father had did. And, and I just remember her trying to wipe her tears. And I said, well, mama, why are you deciding to stay with dad? Cause I had a, a, a inclination what was happening. Um, because in one of the moments that I never forget, forget, uh, I was with my father and he took me to a lady's house. And we're standing there in this lady's house and I understand that this is not my mother. Right. And he says right. to me, don't, don't tell your mom where we've been. And so he leaves me in his room and he walks off, you know, with, with, with the lady in this house. And so we get home and that thing just never set with me. And my course, my mom's like, where y'all been? And I'm like, Oh, you know, he kind of, you know, you know, you, you know how guys sometimes do, man, you kind of make this pact, you know, it's like, Hey, we're not going to talk about this. But for me, I think that's where the breaking really started because I couldn't understand why was we there, but then also uh, why were we keeping this from my mother? Yeah. And yeah. then fast forward, uh, seeing my mother cry and not truly understanding the voice, but I knew there was a part of me that wanted to see my mother free. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know why I wanted um, to see her free. Uh, and what her tears meant to me was that she was not experiencing happiness. And, and I knew that she wasn't experiencing that for a long time. So when the actual divorce happened, I think my father sort of, uh, in some way blamed me because, you know, I'm sort of giving my mom this information. And so when he divorced, uh, her, he divorced all of us, That's and right. particularly That's right. me because I'm his son. And so uh, this started so much rejection, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, seeking for validation. And, you know, as I've shared, I come from a family of professional athletes. My father played ball, my cousin, uncles. And so that's what I knew. But it wasn't until the divorce that I began to lean into sports more because I no longer had my father. So I was now looking to be yes, a father. That's right. right. Letting right. the sport raise you. And for, for, for most men, I want to park here for a second. For most men, uh, particularly for black boys, when we're not fathered well, we don't really have clear direction on 100%. who we want to become. Absolutely. And I really wanted to become something. Yeah. But yeah. I knew I didn't want to become him. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And mm. the only way that I could not become him is I had to have a different experience and football gave me that. And so my mother moved us to Texas. Uh, and, and, you know, I, you know, started playing ball, but during that time I was very depressed and d didn't know it was depression because I was now left to be the man of the house to help my mom and, and to help with my sisters. And so that's where my 
suppressing start. Okay. And for those that are watching, when we begin to suppress things, it leads into depression mm. because depression is anger turned inside out. And so you have this, uh, 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 you have this dissonance and, and, and this unresolved questions, unresolved trauma, unresolved, you know, assumptions and all of these different things. And what we don't, what we do when we can't let it out, we just hold to it. Right, right. So I just held to it and, and I became a cutter at 13. Wow. And I would just cut on myself and I wasn't cutting myself at that time to take my life. I was cutting myself to sort of numb the yep. pain Amen. that I was feeling inwardly. Because mm -hmm. if you understand anything about people who um, uh, carry out self-harm for right. themselves, self right. they're trying right. to numb the inner pain. Right. And so I numbed the inner pain by causing outward pain. And I can remember vividly saying to myself, you don't feel that. Mm. Whoa. At 13. Wow. Man, that is deep, man. I mean, that's so impactful. And we want you to continue because we know for a fact that you're speaking to someone right off of the bat. Because so many of us hide behind what we do. We hide behind our titles or the filter, right, that we live through. And there are these emotions that we're all dealing with in many cases don't know what to call them. Mm -hmm. And then for you to have that, wow, that awareness that you are, you are physically creating harm in your life, but then saying to yourself, convincing yourself, mm -hmm. you don't feel that. Yeah. It's almost as if you were trying intentionally to reinforce it. Do you see that? Actually, let me ask a better question. How do you see that playing out as you continue to talk about your story in the lives of the people you meet and encounter? Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of us that are doing that and don't realize it. We're hurting ourselves or others and then telling ourselves, you don't feel that. You know, part of it, Charles and Ivana, I, as, as I think, is to feel means that you have to be checked in. Present, man. Yeah. And it's easy to be checked out because if I'm checked out, I don't have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So the moment that you're telling yourself that you don't feel that is in that same moment that you're saying, I don't want to deal with this right now, mm -hmm. uh, which is why you, you see much of what we are becoming as a society. Yeah. We are overly prescribed in drugs and medication. We have the highest right, right, right. rate. We have the highest in suicide rate. Right. We have right. the highest uh, in uh, addictions to opioids is because Nobody wants to feel. Nobody mm. wants to feel. Mm. Uh, there was a movie I watched years ago, and I can't remember what it was. It had Tay Diggs, I think it was in it. You probably know the movie. Uh, I think it was called Equilibrium, where that was the whole uh, intent. You know exactly what I'm talking about. They had to take this pill every day so that they couldn't feel anything. Mm. And it was illegal to feel. It was literally a jailable offense if you had feelings of any sort. And they would ban books, burn books. They would raid houses because they were keeping people from feeling. And it's interesting that though we see these things in movies, we're seeing it play out in our real world, in our real time. Yeah, yeah. of course. Oh, Incredible. Yeah, well, well, Incredible. well, well, well that's, that's, that's really what movies are. You know, uh, I'm in film and actually directing a few yes, mental health yes, films uh, now. And much of the stories that we tell is not uh, what we see the world uh, to be. It's, it's what we see the world as it is. Right. And so right. movies, are, movies are telling you what's actually happening. You know, um, even if you were to see a film, I mean, you think about when we looked at films uh, 10 years ago that were talking about uh, AI, artificial intelligence, and right. saw all of these advanced technologies. Um, this is just, it, didn't, it wasn't just popping up, it was actually happening, and the movie was introducing what was actually taking place. Right. Very true. And so, Very what true. we're seeing is a society that is overdosing on social media, overdosing on work, overdosing on success, overdosing on sex, overdosing on everything but feeling. And so, uh, this is why you hear so many people say, man, people are just checked out checked out yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's so true because and you can't, I wanna... you can't because you don't get healing until you feel of course yes, sir. of course of i course. agree with that 
Of course. And you mentioned the process at 13. So as an adolescent, when did you actually check in and what forced you to check in? Oh, I didn't check in until I'm 41. I didn't check in until 31. Wow. Wow. Talk about that process. Yeah, I didn't didn't check in at 31 because um, the entire time I played football, um, I was very numb and football Mm -hmm. Uh, I used it as escapism. Of course. Um, it was the way that I would escape. Um, and as I, I, I talk to players all the time, and I said, for me, I can put that helmet on and become whoever I wanted to. That's right. That's uh, right. I, never, I, I, I never forget telling this guy, I said, I never forget, you know, um, I played running back and fullback. I never forget, you know, getting the ball, and there was this guy in front of me, and I knew I could have made the guy miss. But when I look at his helmet, you I didn't see the guy. I actually saw my dad's oh, face. Whoa. Wow. Wow. And so when I looked and saw that, I saw, I'm not going to make this guy miss. I'm not going to make him miss. I'm going to run I'm gonna right through him. Mm-hmm. I put my chest right in his helmet and, you know, of course, ran the guy over. And there was nothing more satisfying than to do that. Mm-hmm. Because wow. I felt. I felt that I had been wrong as a son and the only way that I can pay some level of vengeance was to punish the guy in front of me, even though he did nothing. Wow. Wow. But man, and oftentimes we're punishing people that didn't hurt us Mm -hmm. because we can't get to the people that that hurt us. Right, right, right. right. Very true. Very true. And when did you feel like that wasn't enough. When did you feel like, okay, I'm punishing these other athletes, but um, you know? Well, for, for for me, it was that 60 minutes that I would play was probably the best time of my life. Mm. Um, I had the most fun ever um, because I didn't think about what I had gone through. I didn't think about the abuse. You know, that's a whole nother topic. My mom remarried when we moved to Texas and married a guy who had just got out of prison, uh, oh. who was very physically abusive uh, to me. So uh, I didn't have time on the field because, you know, the game of football is is a reactionary sport. So you're trained to react. Right. You're trained to react. And so I didn't think about anything. Like, it was uh, such a fulfillment to have trained my body and mind to see something and just to react on wheel, you know, on the top of a dime. And so when I got sent home, uh, when I went to the league, that was the first time that I really had to check in because at this time, football was coming to an end. Yeah. Uh, And so I was really challenged in that area. And that's when I had my first suicide attempt because I was like, man, what am I going to do with my life? I I don't know anything else. All I know is is to play ball. Um, and in my mind, it's like, how am I going to cope? You know, yeah. uh, when I played ball, I wasn't, you know, and these are things that I share with guys, like, you know, when I'm talking about playing, like I wasn't a drinker. Um, I wasn't, I didn't smoke weed. I wasn't a smoker. Uh, I wasn't chasing women. So I was a very quiet guy off the field, very loud guy on the field. So mm-hmm. for me, I didn't have any other coping mechanism. Right, right, right. right. You know, so, I mean, so many guys that I played with, their escape business was they would smoke. Um, some of them, it was sex with different women. So, right. you know, some of them was drinking. So, like, I didn't have none of those vices. Right, right. You know, so, my, my, vice, my vice was go to the gym, run, right. work out, and which is still what I do today, you know. Uh, <laughs> Which I've been seeing you, man. You've been putting in that work, man. I see you got a mean left hook too. Yeah, 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 man. So you know that's that's still my thing, man. And so, um, and fast forward to um, you know finally recovering, and, and and I met a guy in the gym one day that he, he he was he was very instrumental in me becoming comfortable with that football might be over. And I remember him saying, "Dude, it's not the end of the world." Like. You got to stop acting like, you know, the world is against you. And he was a uh, an Italian guy. 
And of course, I took offense to it because when you have not been fathered well, yes, of course, the mentorship well, absolutely, right. very good point, very good point. Absolutely. And I would even say, I would even say it's on both sides. You know, when a, a, a young lady hasn't been mothered well, she can't listen to, you know, uh, a male. Nice. Yeah, right. understood. Right, understood. You know what I mean? Of course, hundred percent. You know, and so, uh, and. He helped me start my business. Um, I started training pro athletes. My business blew up. And after my business blew up, I'm headed into my 30s. And I'm still um, processing like, man, I'm, I'm something is missing. Yes, you can feel it. And I can feel it. I had started, I had wrote my first book, which I wrote for teenagers. And um uh, and by the time that I finished that book, I wrote pieces about my father. And I remember the book getting back to my uncle and my uncle and some of my family members were not happy that I was talking about some of the issues in our family. Mm -hmm. And so it took a turn for the worse. I thought it was going to be like this liberating moment, but it took a turn for the worse. And after this, it took a turn for the worse was when I made my second suicide attempt, which I was really just trying to sort of in the pain because um, the family would talk about me. They would talk about, you know, I mean, a bad man. And I mean, I have seven uncles I'm talking about. They, I mean, they would talk about me to my mother, you know, and, uh, and so I just felt, man, you know, um, you know, as a nephew, I would think that an uncle would sort of take, you know, me under his wing or under their wings and so and i never had any of that from uh from family members um i was always treated like an outcast you know i was the darkest one in my family um i grew up with an aunt that didn't like my skin tone you know she was very racist um um you know i got called black ass you know for you know i, I mean bro it, it was like like this my story man is just crazy you know, mm -hmm. so I had all of these different, mm -hmm. uh, you know, pin points where it's just like, if you touch me on my arm, that hurt. If you touch me on my leg, that hurt. Right. I just had all these pain points. That's what yeah. we were looking for, these pain points where I just had so much pain. And so I was just like, man, I'm done. Right. And I, I, yeah, I actually just talked about this on CBN. Um, I was talking to my mother and her and my father was on the phone and we're having a conversation and they're just kind of like, you know, why are you going to keep going through this cycle? And nobody would listen to me. Mm. Mm. Every time I tried to talk about how you things felt. he did affected me, mm. I would just get blown away, you know, push it aside. And so um, eventually I just told my mom on the phone call, I said, I've had enough, man. Mm -hmm. And she's like, Jay, please don't do this. I said, I've had enough, man. And, and you know, and I uh, said to her, I said, you know, I don't desire to, to keep going through this, to have a father, to look at his son as if I am the problem when you cause mm -hmm. the problem. Mm -hmm. That's hard. Can't even it's really to imagine. Difficult. You know, and I'm like, you know, I watched you leave my mother and marry another woman with three kids, and you were an all American dad to these like, yeah, he's like that's that how that right, right. with your psyche, right? You know, and my mom said to me, she says, Well, if you take your life, you can possibly end up in hell. And I said to her, very uh, con confident. With much confidence, I said, I don't care where I, where I wake up as long as I can end this pain. Wow. 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 That's deep. So deep, man. And there are so many others that feel the same way. And you know? that's what I'm thinking as we're saying that. The pain points of life. And as you continue to do the work to heal and to forgive, what actually was the indicator of you're going to live transition. life freely. You're going to live and you're going to transition into healing. You know, the, the transition into healing was something that I stumbled into 
Um, I survived the attack and I, you know, have to get all of this help, man, and, and stuff. And so finally, friends of mine was just like, and my godmother, who I was living with, because, uh, and I and I shared this, if I wasn't living with her, I would have shot myself. Mm. But I didn't shoot myself because I didn't want her to find, I didn't want to right. leave a mess. I understand. So I was very, so I was very cognitive of how I wanted to go. Of course. Because I, um, I was staying with her in her guest bedroom and she had carpet at the time. Mm. I, I had planned all of this out. I said, man, I can't leave this in her house. Right, be, right. You know what I mean? To leave that right. picture in right. her head. So I, so I overdosed because I knew I could go away quietly and it wouldn't leave a mess. Mm. Uh, so, you know, once I come to myself and she says to me, Jay, you have got to get some help. And uh, I spent a few days in prayer afterward and just sitting and talking with God. And I never forget uh, uh, the voice of the Lord saying to me is that you got to give this to me. Mm, yeah. And I didn't want to give it to him because I didn't know what he would do with it. And that's a lot right. of love. Yes. That is. Yes. You know, um, I wanted to hold on to it because it was also how I felt significant. Of course. Of course. Of course. It gave you identity. It's always like that, yeah. Yeah, which is why most people don't heal because being sick validates their existence. Yeah. Mm, that's real. That's real. What a Write that down. <laughs> Being sick. Because if I get healed, I have to become a new person. That's right. right. And, and most do people work. don't want to do that Come work Come and on. don't no. want the work no. done on them. Come on. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. That's huge. So I, my first session in therapy was the most transformative experience I had had as a man when he asked me, how did I feel? And I remember not really knowing what that meant. Yeah. I didn't have the, I didn't know what emotions were. I just knew anger mm. and anger is a secondary emotion. Um, it is a very low hanging fruit, um, because many times what we're calling anger could possibly be rejection. Of course. That's right. Absolutely. 100%. Absolutely. 100%. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it could be molestation. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I get in there and, and I start doing the work and the guy says, uh, will you come back next week? I said, yes, sir. And I mean, I'm crying like a baby in these things, man. And, and I just kept going and, and then I would take a break and I would start going. And, and one day I'm working at a group home and uh, working at an all girls facility and I'm helping teenage girls who are victims of sex trafficking. Um, I've always been very programmatic, and so I created these programs, and it's, it's helping the girls, and the staff is like, hey, can you get Mr. J to do this for us? And everybody's, and you know, I'm just kind of like, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm teaching emotional intelligence, and I don't even know it. Because I call my program. <laughs> I'll be knowing it. So um, this lady, uh, Miss uh, Alicia Jarrett, I'll never forget her name. She called me in our office, and she says, Jay, um, I'm mean, have a seat. And I said, and she's like, you know, how you doing? I said, oh, I'm good. I was like, I thought I was in trouble. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I was the only, I was, I was the only man that was allowed in these facilities. But you know, I'd always work with teenagers, and so they love my program. And she says, she says, you ever thought about being a therapist? Like, therapist, he's right. <laughs> like we don't do that. <laughs> yeah, I was like, you know, you know, I said some things I won't repeat on here. I was like, <laughs> you know. You know, I, I've all, there's one thing about me, I've always been, been me. I was like, listen, lady, I'm a nigga. I don't do that. <laughs> wow. But wait, but there's some truth because wow. again, he's talking about how many of us in our culture really perceive, perceive therapy, yeah. and how strongly we have this disengagement to it yeah. to the point where she's asking you, would you consider being on the other side of it? And you're like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah. I was like, this is man, like, I, you know, so man, she said, Jay, just think about it. And I'm like, at this time, I'm 33 years old. It's been two years since my attempt. And um, I said, okay, I go home and started researching like universities, and, you know, and I'm like, all right, man. So I find one that has a very interesting backdrop to uh, their management.
methods of how they help students become great therapists. Okay. And I've always been a reader and I was like, oh my God, this is interesting. So I was like, send this little, fill out this information and I got a phone call and um, they started talking about the entry program. And so the lady's like, so why do you want to be a therapist? I said, man, I don't even know. <laughs> so I said, do you have time? She says, yeah. And so I said, this is my story. The woman is crying on the thing. And she said, you would make an amazing therapist. Mm -hmm. She was like, I've never heard anyone share a lived experience the way that you did and the conviction that's in your voice. Absolutely. She said, I think this is the right program for you. <laughs> so I, I sent over my transcripts and all of that stuff, man. And the first class was foundation to family therapy, the foundation of family therapy. That first class, it started digging into the genealogy of our family dynamics and family history and understanding behaviors and how they are attached to the familial system. And I said, oh my God, this is my life. This is what I'm supposed right. to be. And um, I stuck with it, man. And I was, you know, so drawn, like, I, I mean, I spent the, because I was going, I was a non-traditional student going online. And for one year, I did not go out on Friday night. I did homework yeah. one year All straight right. every Friday and committed myself to learning and, and really studying because there were no black that we were talking about, you know, the mental health space is very Eurocentric. Um, it's, it's a bit whitewashed. And so I didn't hear black, you know, so here I was a black man that was a former athlete that was trying to insert myself into this world. And my understanding started to outgrow a lot of the methods. And so when I was sharing classroom, they was like, how did you, How'd get you that even come up with that? Room? Right. And I realized that there was this anointing that God placed That's on me. Right. And then there was this mission that he had placed in me. And of course, none of this would uh, really be revealed until 2020. But in 2015, this is before I signed up for the the class. Again, uh, the voice of the Lord says something is coming, and you're going to be needed. And this is 2015. And sure enough, I finished school in 2018. Uh, I walk in 2019. And the pandemic hit in the top of 20, well, Kobe passed in January 2020. Pandemic happened March 12th, I think 2020. And I started doing videos about grief. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. it just yeah. boom, caught yeah. fire. It's yeah. unreal, man. Uh, Timing, uh, though. Yeah. And yes. for those four and a half years that I was in school, Charles, I never spoke about mental health on my social media. Wow. And it was unreal. I, well, I'm saying I remember that because you and I uh, struck a friendship through social media. And at that time, it was just we were connecting. But then all of a sudden, I remember being like, what the heck's going on with Jay? Like, it's like, boom, boom, boom. And you're right. Just all of a sudden, the transition of what God was bringing into your life. In fact, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I want to say this because it's very important. There is a video of you. You were in a church service at Dr. T.D. Jake's service and he confirmed exactly what god has said to you he was giving a he was literally giving a sermon in the middle of his sermon he stops i don't know you brother i don't know what this is i don't know who you are but there's something there god is showing me there's something there and then he starts just prophesying wow. about the size yeah. and the scope and the magnitude of what god was going to do through your testimony wow and that yeah, started the yeah. relationship. And before you knew it, you were just on this bullet exactly. train yeah. of helping yeah, and yeah, changing. Yeah. You become a voice for our culture. Mm. You become a voice in the mental health space where men like me, women like my wife can hear and respect. Again, you're the first, and I mean this, black face that I can ever associate with mental health. Mm. You actually wow, made mental health important for our people again 
Mm-hmm. I remember wow. right before wow. you when we would talk about mental health, you think about this, and you know too, because you were on the outside while you were working on yourself, but we still had those stigmas. You know, we don't see therapists. We don't mm. need help. You know, they just want to get in your business. Whatever you've learned or you felt yeah, or you yeah. saw being, you know, an African-American or person of color here. But then here you are and you're making it matter again. And men are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I got I got some feelings, too, I need to talk about, you know. <laughs> and then you right. went on the Just Heal yeah. tour. What was what was the brother's name you partnered with? Um, he played on Queen, Queen Sugar. Sugar. What was his name? Oh, Lamont Rucker. Yes, I'm so sorry I couldn't come up with his name off the top of my head, but I remember you guys started speaking, and it was just like, all of a sudden, this man is really ministering to a people. Yeah. Yeah. You're literally changing culture, bro, and you're at the forefront of that. Right. So again, I didn't want to interrupt your thought, but I I would have been remiss if I didn't point that out. So what did it mean to you, going back to what you were going to say? And how God had already given you that word. And mm-hmm. then you had someone like a Bishop T.D. Jakes of all people in the entire world say to you what you had just heard. And then boom. Man, um, it's funny because I, I was just talking with Bishop uh, on Friday when I was in between flights. We were meeting on Zoom, catching up. And it's surreal that we, you know, we have this father-son relationship. And it was... Um, crazy because I didn't know Bishop when he prophesied to me and that was 20 to July 1st, 2018. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I lived in Houston and I was just up here visiting, um, the church in Dallas at that time. And i relocated to Houston during the pandemic. Uh, when I started practicing, uh, I was working in private practice. And so when we started the tour, um, it was just myself and Lamont and Lawrence, and then we brought on uh, Dr. O'Shawn, and then we brought on Dr. Joel Tugman. Uh, and so Joel and I had connected, and he started, uh, you know, uh, I, I, again, I didn't, none of this was privy to me, so I didn't know Bishop was following my work um, mm-hmm. at all. So Joel comes on, and, and of course, you know, if you're doing anything under Bishop, you can't do it without his permission. Yeah. So Joel had to get his permission to come on the tour with me. So one day we're in um, Houston and we did um, uh, a, a date here in Dallas and the city provi- uh, presented us with a, pl- a, a, a proclamation and Joel didn't get here. So I said, yo, I'm going to come to church on Sunday and I'll bring you yours. I saw that. <laughs> so I bring it. So I bring it to church. This is this is May 2022. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> so I bring it to church and Joel's like, yo, come to the back. So when I come to the back, you know, I got my backpack and I was like, yo, man, we give this thing. Bishop is back there. Mm-hmm. And so I turn around and uh, Bishop says, hey, how you doing? And, you know, I'm like, man, how you doing, Bishop? And he was like, yo, I love your work, man. I, I love what you're doing for men. And he stepped back and he starts prophesying. And he says to me, he says, you're healing ancient souls. Mm. No, he said, you're healing, you're healing ancient wounds. Wow. And he's, and you know, he's in his, he's like, you're standing on the open heaven. And so I <laughs> said to him, I said, I said, Bishop, I got to show you something. I pulled up the video in my phone and I showed them this. And he looked and he started crying. Oh my gosh. And he said, wait a minute. He said, that's you? I said, yes, sir. He said, man, I always wondered what happened to you. Wow. So he had no idea that I was the guy that was behind Jeff Hill, bro, that he had prophesied. Oh my gosh. What That's amazing. Amazing. That's amazing. amazing. Just the just testament. The testament. I mean, he, the he just grabbed me and he just kept hugging me and he wouldn't let me go. And he stepped back into the moment. He said, I remember it like yesterday. And then some of the pastors was around and they was like, Yeah, I we remember. all remember it. And he said, I, he said, You were sitting right here. I was standing right there. He said, I'd never forget that day. Wow. He wow. said, I always wondered what happened to you. He said, you built all of this since then. I said, yes, sir. He said, you go to my church? I said, yes, sir. I'm here every Sunday. And he said, where do you sit? I said, mm. I sit in the back. And he said, uh, 
Oh, there's why, so why, much. He said, why, why, he said, why are you just now coming to me? Right. I said, um, I don't know, Bishop. I said, I, I, I probably wanted it to be organic and to sort of be a God uh, right. moment. Right. And so he asked me, he's like, um, he says, I think I know why you didn't come. But I said, well, Bishop, I'm going to just be honest, man. I'm a real nigga. Mm. Just like that. Mm. I said, I was going to build this thing brick by brick. Regardless. And he stepped back and he said, I respect you for that. Because mm. I didn't want him to feel that I wanted to partner with him. Yes, right, come right, on, To bro. get the help. That's exactly. right. That's exactly. right. That's right. That's right. Wow, this is so great. Building it outside of the church, you have a greater respect for what the for the work that I've done outside, for the work that I can do inside, because I now can pull men who would never go to church. Come That's on, right. bro. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. I always say if you're fishing in the fish market, it's not fishing. Mm. Mm. <laughs> That's a good one. So, exactly. And um, he said, you need to come around more. And we started building a friendship and started building. He said, you're my son. He said, it's one thing to be a son that's lost outside of the house. It's another thing to be lost inside the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come closer. Yeah. Wow. And he said, come closer so I can father you. Mm -hmm. wow. And man, it's it's been humbling because uh, my father and I have, we haven't necessarily repaired uh, the relationship. It's stable. But Bishop can give me what I need at this level sure. because I'm flying at an altitude that my father has never flown. Right, 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 right. And couldn't. When I tell you I am being ministered to myself. So that's why when you, uh, when you sent that book, The Flight of Your Life, man, it's a testament to what my story has been. It's been this, this flight of my life that, you know, it's, change altitudes. Uh, I've had to land a few times. I've had to drop off some luggage. Come on, bro. Right, right. Take back off. You know what I mean? I've had, there was seasons where I was on autopilot. There was seasons yeah. where I had to climb. You know, uh, there was season where there was much turbulence. Come yeah. on, bro. This man yeah. about to make me hop out this seat. <laughs> no, stay here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So your your book, man, has uh, and and I've always, you know, uh, and I told you, you know, you know, when time permitted that, you know, we would do this. Yeah, man, you you don't realize what it's done for me emotionally. Bless you, bro. Wow. Because it's hard to articulate uh, when you're flying, because there's times I felt like I was building a plane and flying it at the same time. Mm. Of course, of course. Wow, wow. So when you think about the flight of your life, you think about the cost of the airfare. Mm -hmm. <sighs> and for me, my humility is always tied to what it's cost me. Mm. You know, um, people marvel at the the platforms and they're enamored with the people that I stand next to, but no one can really comprehend that airfare price. Come on, mm. what it costs you. That's, that's right. how it always goes. And then having to embrace the delays. Yeah. Yes, come on, bro. That's Setbacks, right. Setbacks, delays, that's right. transitions. Sit right there, knowing it's your time. <laughs> we know. But you can't go anywhere. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> yes, that's sir. Right. That's real. That's wow. real. So I, I'm blessed. So I'm I'm blessed by you and your your wife commitment. Um, and that's a book, man, that you can build a sermon series off of, a coaching series. I mean, you can do because you think about it, man. I mean, to take the flight of your life. Yeah. It it's 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 taking introspection of what that could possibly be. Mm -hmm. Because that meaning is not definitive to one thing. It's a myriad of, of multiple factors. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely, man. Wow. So, so thank you, brother.
for pinning that uh, poignant uh, piece of literary. Thank you so much, man. I couldn't do it without this woman here. And like I said, her story is just as impactful written in the, the pages of that book. Yeah. And I'm so grateful to know that my life, her life has impacted someone like you yeah. who is impacting and changing culture and generations and mindsets and even you, changing you to be a part of your story, bro. Yeah. There's no greater honor, man. And like I said, man, I love you and I'm proud of you and I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful I have a friend, a brother, Brother. Again, we've been in contact. It's not like, you know, some people are like, oh, yeah, we talked once. We talked twice. No, but we stay in touch. And mm -hmm. I love that about us because you are you are honoring us and just the fact that you're willing to be a part of our lives as well. And you're inspiring us. But before you go, because I know I want to respect your time, there's so many things I have to do. And I do this often on our show. And I extract some things that you said. Because in this show, we have CEOs. You probably already seen that. We have athletes, NFL athletes, professional. Olympians, professional, professional. athletes, um, you know, leaders in business and sport. We have young athletes that watch this. Yeah. And you're speaking to all of them because no matter what position they're in, there is the thing that we'll typically hide behind our title, as you said earlier, and not know what to do with the pain. So I want to give you a few minutes before uh, we get off the show to give some thoughts on how someone – maybe dealing with some of the things you walk through, would be able to find healing? What are some steps they can take? What are some advice you would give them? And then I'm going to pull out three or four more things that I want to make sure I share before you go. Yeah, absolutely. I think number one is discovering who do you want to become? Mm -hmm. I, I think the, the one thing that I learned in therapy is one day he said, if you were to wake up and everything was better and okay, who have you become to see that? Mm. And I think so many times we're not clear on who we want to become. So everything around us defines us, whether it's exactly. our job, whether it's our neighborhood, whether it's a relationship. And so I would encourage the men, the women, the boys, the girls, the athletes, not what, what, whatever you are, who do you want to become? Who do you want? Uh, and secondly, how will you become that? Mm -hmm. Who's a part that's of that journey? That's right. That's right. Uh, the becoming part was so important because you now have to make a decision mm -hmm. on the what. Yes, what are sir. you going to do different? Right. You know, what are you going to do different? Uh, what are you going to read? What are you going to listen to? Because that's all right. of these things are encompassing to what we become. And the one thing that my therapist always challenged me because I came in with three strong words. I never forget it. Uh, my three words at that time that defined how I felt was loss, uh, no confidence, mm -hmm. and inadequate. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't, I didn't, I remember sitting there in tears and I was just like, man, I don't, I don't know what I'm capable of besides putting a yeah. ball in my hand. Yeah. And I think it's important for, particularly for young men to understand their abilities. So you have clear insight on your capabilities. That's um, right. Um, and, and so, uh, and this, this help you to foresee what you can become. That's right. Oh, no. And what, what I wanted to become, Charles, was free. That's all I ever wanted. Yeah. I wanted to wake up and not feel the weight of my mm -hmm. father's rejection, not feel the weight of being this surrogate father to my sisters, this stand-in husband to my mother. I just wanted mm -hmm. to be free from the obligations that yeah. it was on me. Right. And I wanted to know how could I feel powerful that I didn't have to commit to something that I didn't create mm. because I committed to being this dad to my sisters, this husband to my mom. You know, all of my life, I was the prayer warrior. You know, I was the prophetic eye. I was oftentimes when I was playing ball, you know, the financial resources you know, resource. And I mean, so I had all this weight, man. And wow. I carried it from 13 to 31. Jeez. And so for me, I just wanted to know what was it like to be free to say no, to say right. I can't do it, to say I don't feel good. Like right. I, I could I, I could never think at any point in my life, I do it now, 
but having the ability to say, I can't do that. I just can't. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have it in me. You know, um, so those are the two things that, that would stand out that I would encourage everyone decide who do you want to become mm -hmm. and then decide how will you become that and for some of you that may be therapy that may be coaching that may be finding a mentor um, mm -hmm. but you would have to have someone to help aid and guide you into becoming that I think so yes. many times in black culture um, there's this this sense of uh, honor if we can say that we're self-made right and man, come on, fallacy, bro. Tired. And nobody, nobody. <laughs> no one. Can't not be. One. Can't be. Self-made nothing. Not even self-made millionaire. Right. 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 No. Right. No. no. Right. No. right. No. And so you you can't do it on your own. And then mm -hmm. understanding that change um, is both a process and an outcome. Mm -hmm. So it won't happen overnight. It will be a process. But as mm -hmm. you are changing, the outcome would be that of your changed behavior, your yes. changed way of thinking, your changed way of speaking. All yes. of those things are under the umbrella of a mental health. Right. Yes. Right. It's true. <laughs> it's very right. true. And you know, you mentioned, I wanted to mention this Please. as well. First of all, we're so proud of you. So we are so proud. honored. We celebrate you for all the decisions that you've made to yeah. get to this point and to do the work. And it is very interesting. I was listening very intently as a coach, but oh, yeah. listening, how you always had one person. You always. always, you thought about your aunt, you didn't go through premeditatively with the plan to kill yourself. Now, when you think about how much was compounded on your heart, your mind, your spirit, and your soul, yeah. you could have ended it. But every single time you had her, you had the Italian man, you had Bishop T.D. Jakes, yeah. you had somebody to way. navigate and guide you into where you needed to be. And they also supported you. They yeah. gave you vision. They shared insight with you. They changed the trajectory of not just the pain, mm. but shifted you and positioned you into purpose. And that is, it. it we celebrate and honor that because you had a choice Right. to say, That's I'm right. good. Mm. I want to be self-made. Yeah. I don't need your help. I don't yeah. need your support. But yeah. you took the time to heal, to grow, to learn every Friday night. You know how many athletes and post-athletes Absolutely. and people are like, no, my Friday nights are going oh, out. Nights, you right. took that to learn yeah. and to become a master and to have expertise yes, and become a doctor in what you're doing. So all of that to say, doing the work matters and it takes time it takes time yes, but does. when you do those people that are supposed to align with you will yeah. always find you they will be and there. i respect that Ooh, look at them <laughs> telling y'all right here <laughs> man i mean my gosh Jay, look can we have you for another hour <laughs> golly he might invoice yeah, us. yeah he, he might definitely will us. <laughs> he's like you lucky you got this <laughs> <laughs> but but before we go, I'll say these few things because I know that someone watching, there's there's something that was said to you on the inside, whether it be your mind or your heart. Yes. And I just want to reiterate a few things that Dr. J has said through his story. First thing, remember, you're not alone because you have struggle. Mm -hmm. And if you're an athlete, remember, it is not who you are. It's not your identity. No. It is a way for you, yes, to express yourself. But as he's been trying to communicate, it's okay to express all of who you are. The coaches that are around you, despite what you may feel, they are there for you because they spend time with you. That's right. The intention is for you to utilize them in your life. Mm -hmm. And then third, know that your trauma, the things that you're hiding from or that you're hiding, there's a purpose for them. Right. You can do great things because of what you've gone through. Right. You've been gifted and anointed to do hard things because you're walking through those hard things. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to give you courage because this is what he's showing you. Look at who he's become That's and right. who he's becoming. Mm -hmm. Look at who is still alive and who is becoming because of having met him. Same thing for you. Your life is meant to impact the lives of everyone around you. And trust me, if you're not here, that impact will be felt because it'll be missed. And we want to encourage you. So if you're struggling out there and you need help, you have someone like Dr. J, who we're going to get his information in a few minutes because he does do counseling and coaching. But we also want you to know that there's pe people and places you can call, like this resource center, which you'll see right between my two fingers right here. If you're struggling with suicide or mental health and you really think of harming yourself, yourself, call this number. Don't let yourself be the one person that didn't say, I didn't take advantage of the people that were around me. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I want to make sure I will tell you is remember, God uses your trauma. Yes. 
This is not something that you're going through so that you can say, he doesn't like me, they don't like me, everyone doesn't like me. No, you're being prepared for something. And the way we write it in our book, we, we spell it a little differently. Mm -hmm. It's prepared, P-A-I-R-E-D. You're mm -hmm. literally being paired for an assignment that only you can walk through. On, There's man. no one else on this entire planet that can do what you're capable of doing, but they won't do it if you're not here. Mm -hmm. So we need you. Yeah. I wanted to make sure I stress all of that because that was all discussed right here on this show yes. if you are listening. And just know that we're listening too. Dr. J, how can people find you? Tell them your social, tell them your websites, and any other thing, any other resource you want to offer. Yes, sir. Uh, all of my social media is the same across Twitter or X or whatever Elon calls it. Uh, King J Barnett uh, on Instagram, the same as uh, Facebook as well. And then my counseling website is kjbcoaching.com. So they are the initials of King J Barnett, so kjbcoaching.com. Man, we appreciate you, Jay. Honored. Oh, my oh, gosh. Thank you. Man, what <laughs> You've you have added so much me. depth. Thank you so you much. You are not kidding. Sheesh. We've needed someone yeah. to speak to this yeah. for a long time, and it we're grateful that it's you. That has, yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. absolutely, thank man. You. Thank you guys for having me. Of course. <laughs> well, you want to close out? Man, go ahead. Just all right, all right. <laughs> all right. We're both trying to work through our job right now, Lord. No, but sincerely, King Jay, thank you so much for being here, man. Once again, if you haven't already done so, we're going to tell you one more time, and don't let this be, you know what, this is the last time I'm going to tell you. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Hit that like, but definitely, I'm going to say this with sentimental value when I mean this, hit share. Yeah, definitely. Because you this know one, someone for sure. who's thinking like this, and even if you don't know, mm -hmm. if you have a little bit of inclination. attention or inclination, right. there may be someone that would benefit from hearing this mm -hmm. to know that their life, 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, can be just as huge as this and making an impact that they never saw for themselves. Yeah. So please share this episode because it's very important. And once again, if you need help, you see where my fingers are, there'll be a number right here. So you can call if you need any help, psychology, psychology help, suicide awareness, whatever, please go ahead and do that. That's it. That's it for the show. Thank you so much for joining us again on Aspire Heart with Charles and Ivana Bailey.